Noonan, Georgia, April 23rd. Sam Holes, the Negro murderer of Albert Cranford and the assailant of Cranford's wife, was burned at the stake one mile and a quarter from this place this afternoon at 2.30 o'clock. Fully 2,000 people surrounded the small sapling to which he was fastened and watched the flames eat away his flesh, saw his body mutilated by knives, and witnessed, and witnessed the contortions of his body in extreme agony. Such suffering was seldom been witnessed, and through it all, the Negro uttered hardly a cry. During the contortions of his body, several blood vessels burst. The spot selected was an ideal one for such an affair, and the stake was in full view of those who stood about and with unfeigned satisfaction saw the Negro meet his death and saw his torture before, saw him tortured before the flames killed him. A few smoldering ashes scattered about the place, a blackened state, and all that is left to tell the story. Not even the bones of the Negro were left in the place, but were eagerly snatched by a crowd of people drawn here from all directions, who almost fought over the burning body of the man, carving it with knives and seeking souvenirs of the occurrence. Preparations for the execution were not necessarily elaborate, and it required only a few minutes to arrange to make Sam Holes pay the penalty of his crime. To the sapling, Sam Holes was tied, and he watched the cool, determined men who went about arranging to burn him. First, he was made to remove his clothing, and when the flames began to eat into his body, it was almost noon. Before the fire was lighted, his left ear was severed from his body. Then his right ear was cut away. During this proceeding, he uttered not a groan. Other portions of his body were mutilated by the knives of those who gathered about him. But he was not wounded to such an extent that he was not fully conscious and could feel the excruciating pain. Oil was poured over the wood that was placed about him, and this was ignited. The scene that followed is one that never will be forgotten by those who saw it. And while Sam Holt withered and performed contortions in his agony, many of those present turned away from the sickening sight, and others could hardly look at it. Not a sound but the crackling of the flames broke the stillness of the place, and the situation grew more sickening as it proceeded. The state bent under the strains of the Negro in his <laughs> agony, and his sufferings cannot be described, although he uttered not a sound. After his ears had been cut off, he was asked about the crime. And it was that he made a full confession. At one juncture before the flames had begun to get in their work well, the fastening that held him to the stake broke, and he fell forward partially out of the fire. He withered in agony, and his sufferings can be imagined when it is said that several blood vessels burst during the contortions of his body. When he fell from the stake, he was kicked back and the flames renewed. Then it was that the flames consumed his body and in a few minutes only a few bones and a small part of the body was all that was left of Sam Holmes. One of the most sickening sights of the day was the eagerness with which the people grabbed after souvenirs. And they almost fought over the ashes of the dead criminal. Large pieces of his flesh were carried away, and persons were seen walking through the streets carrying bones in their hands. 
when all the larger bones together with the flesh had been carried away by the early comers, others scraped in the ashes, and for a great length of time, a crowd was about the place scraping in the ashes. Not even the stake to which the Negro was tied when burned was left, but it was properly chopped down and carried away as the largest souvenir of the burning. When part of the crowd made a raid on the Tenderloin district, hoping to find there some belated Negro for a sacrifice. They were urged on by the white prostitutes who applauded their murderous mission, says an account. The red light district was an excitement. Women, that is, the white women, were out on their stoops, peeping over the galleries and through their windows and doors, shouting to the crowds to go on with their work and kill Negroes for them. Mm. Our best wishes, boys, they encouraged, and the mob answered with shouts, and whenever a Negro's house was slighted and bombarded, was started on the doors and the windows. No colored men were found on the streets until the mobs reached Custom House Place and the leader streets. Here, a victim was found and brutally put to death. The description is as follows. Some stragglers had a run with a Negro into a car at the corner of Benville and Valier Streets. He was seeking refuge in a conveyance, and he believed that the car would not be stopped and could speed along. But the mob determined to stop the car and ordered the motorman to halt. He put on his brake. Some white men were in the car. Get out, fellows, shouted several of the mob. All whites fall out was a second cry, and the poor Negro understood that it was meant that he should stay in the car. He wanted to save his life. The poor fellow cried under, crawled under the seats, but some unto the crowd saw him and yelled that he was hiding. Two or three men climbed through the window with their pistols. Others jumped over the motor months, over, over the motor month board, and dozens troubled into the rear of the car. Big, strong, big, strong hands got the Negro by the shirt. He was dragged out of the conveyance and was pushed into the streets. Some fellow ran up and struck him with a club. The blow was heavy, but it did not fail him. And the Negro ran toward Canal Street, stealing along the wall of the Tulane Medical Building. Fifty men ran after him, caught the poor fellow and hurried him back into the crowd. Fists were aimed at him high. The clubs went upon the shoulders, and finally the black plunged into the gutter. A gun was fired, and the Negro who had just got into his feet dropped again. He tried to get up, but a volley was sent after him, and in a little while, he was dead. The crowd looked at the terrible work. Then the lights in the houses of the ill flamed began to light up again, and women peeped out of the blinds. The motorman was given the order to go on. The gong claimed the conveyance sped out of the way. For half an hour, the crowd held their place at the corner. Then the patrol wagon came and the body was picked up and hurried to the morgue. Coroner Richard held an, held an autopsy on the body of the Negro, who was forced out of car number 98 of the Valier line and shot down. It was found that he was wounded four times, the most serious wound being that which struck him on the right side, passing through the lungs and causing hemorrhages, which brought him to his death. Nobody tried to identify the poor fellow, and his name is still unknown. She said that during the riot, a young fellow whom she had sent to the grocery to get a chicken was knocked off his wheel by the mob. Then the mob took his wheel and struck him on the side of his head with a brick and knocked a hole in it. His name was Jimmy Eckford, 18 years old, and roomed at her house. He ran into the nearest yard, which happened to be that of white people. When the mob said they would burn this house down if they didn't make Eckford come out, the tenants picked him up and threw him out into the street to the mob where he was kicked and stamped on and beaten till they knocked his teeth from his head and killed him. The streetcars ran right along in front of her house. As she saw white women stop the streetcars and pull colored women off and beat them. One woman's clothes they tore off entirely and then took off their shoes and beat her over the face and head with their shoe heels. Another woman who got away 
ran down the street with every stitch of clothes torn off her back, leaving her with only her shoes and stockings on. Mrs. Howard saw two men beaten to death. She had escaped all, excepting having rocks thrown at the house, until this soldier humiliated her by coming into our house and arresting her and the women there because they couldn't find any guns concealed. This happened on the morning of the 5th. The next is Clarissa Lockett's story. Mrs. Lockett lived in the house with her brother, where she had been ever since. Both he and she came from Mississippi. Her brother worked nights so that all during the rioting Monday night, she was alone. They didn't get to set fire to her house that night, but she sat up all night long waiting. She was unwilling to leave her household goods until she had to. She went to work at the packing house Tuesday morning early, but quit at 9 a.m. at 9 a.m. The soldiers who were guarding the plant took her and the other colored women home. Tuesday night, the mob came to her number, 48 Third Street Rear. After they had set fire to it and run her out, she ran into a Polish saloon not far away, and the saloon keeper and his wife agreed to let her stay there that night. Although they knew the risk, they ran in so doing. They told her to crouch down behind the piano and to stay there quietly all night. This she did, glad of the chance. She had been able only to bring her dog and her gun when she ran out of her home. After the salon keeper and his wife had gone upstairs to bed about one o'clock in the morning, the barkeeper and a man friend of his came back behind the piano and attempted to assault her. She drew her pistol and drove them off. The two women were put in jail. Before doing this, however, they searched the house for Ed Ware. He was secretary of the hated union. They broke open trunks and jars, took all of Ware's books, files, accounts with pe work people, secretary's minutes, and Masonic lodge books away with them. They shot into the mirrors of the house and took fiendish delight in destroying all things. They left the old man's body in the house for four days before they buried it. Long, Necker, and Jackson gave the wares three rooms of furniture to poor whites, whom they afterwards moved on the place. After keeping Mrs. Ware and the girl who was arrested with her in jail at hard labor for four weeks, sleeping sometimes on the concrete floor, they were discharged with 17 others, told to go back home and to go to work as they had always done and quote, never join nothing, never join nothing more unless they got their lawyer's or landlord's consent, end, end of quote. Mrs. Ware went back to get what she had left and found nothing. She saw her safe in a Mrs. Forsyth's house and a Mr. George had her chairs. A woman named Lula Black, who with her four children were working on a farm, was dragged out of her home by the mob and asked, asked if she belonged to the union. She answered yes. They asked her why. She said, quote, because it would better the condition of the colored people. When they worked, it would help them to get what they worked for, end quote. When she said that, they knocked her down, beat her over the head with their pistols, kicked her all over her body, and almost killed her, then took her to jail. The same mob went to Frank Hall's house and killed Francis Hall a crazy old woman housekeeper, tired her clothes over her head, threw her body in the public road where it lay, thus exposed till the soldiers came Thursday evening and took it up. 